Okay, so we're here now with Gemma Williams. We're here in the Relief Society building. Thank you for hosting us, Sister Eva. You're welcome. We love this place. And Gemma, let me introduce you to all the sisters that are going to be watching and listening to this conversation. You're our expert today. And Gemma, you have a bachelor's degree in psychology from BYU. You also have a master's in clinical social work. And you've worked as a licensed clinical social worker as family service, at family services for 14 years, helping families, individuals, missionaries, and your latest assignment is Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Gemma. I'm so happy you're here with us today. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Good. Tell us where you're from. So I, I grew up in England. Uh -huh. um, I have a Welsh father and a Spanish mother, so I'm, I guess, 50-50. We have a lot of common. We yeah. can be best friends, Gemma, after this. <laughs> Good. And Sister Ewan, thank you for being here with us again. We're super excited to have this conversation. I am too. And Gemma, it just happened to be she was in Utah, because you work in California, is mm -hmm. that right? That's correct. Yeah. So yeah. we're just happy you would come and we would have this chance to just be together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we were mentioning, we've had like thousands of questions come our way for this event, Sister to Sister. And a lot of the questions deal with very painful topics and especially related to mental health, right? And anxiety and depression. And let's address the elephant in the room. We are leaving a year behind that I really don't want to ever remember. A tough year with a worldwide pandemic, a lot of families, a lot of people suffering in many ways, financially, health-wise, etc. Um, there's a lot of that going on still, and I think for years to come, we're still dealing with the effects of it, right? I can tell you my experience with the pandemic, all of a sudden I was a working mom, and the next day I was a stay-home mom, working full-time from home, homeschooling my kids. Uh, we got a puppy, which was the craziest decision. It was a COVID decision. And then, you know, all is happening at once, and I remember feeling extremely overwhelmed like crying myself to sleep at night, thinking there's no way I can do all this. So we would like to start talking about that. First of all, how was the pandemic for you? Because I think you and I have a lot in common, right? We do, yeah. I've got two young children. They're not school age, but they were in preschool and preschools were closed. So, mm -hmm. so I've got a two and a four year old at oh. home and, and we've been juggling my husband's school and work and my work and, and the two kids. So. It's, it's a lot. no joke. It was no <laughs> joke. And Sister Eubank, that's there's a different angle to these. Uh, a lot of families all of a sudden they were home all day together, craziness. Everybody trying to do their Zoom meetings and, but you know, for a lot of people it was a, a period of very you know lonely period. Tell us a little bit about that. How was the pandemic for you? For well, example? I sense the stress when you talk about your lives, but for many people in my situation and, and other situations, the pandemic completely shut them off at home. They couldn't be with their families. They, they were cut off from church, they couldn't go to the temple, they d often weren't even getting the sacrament, and there was just a real loneliness. This cut off, I'm cut off from all my support, and sometimes digital just doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was a lot of stress, I, I feel that way, that existed before, but the pandemic just made it worse. So Gemma, as an expert, what, what are some of the ways, so what is it that you've seen in your professional life that people have dealt through, and how can we, how can we be better and deal better with these type of situations? Well, I think it's interesting that you use the phrase be better. I think as women, we're often really, really hard on ourselves, right? Um, when I listen to women complain or, or about themselves or their inability to do more, especially during this, this kind of online school thing, I think what makes you think you're not doing a lot already, right? We're, we're, we're doing what we were usually doing plus all these extra things. And so to set an expectation to also be doing family history or you know, all these other things is not realistic, right? Um, and the fear, I think, sometimes is that, oh, I'm, I'm getting behind spiritually, I'm not progressing. And I guess my, my counter argument would be, what makes you think that doing online school doesn't help you s progress spiritually, right? Mm -hmm. Because it does, what you're doing every day with your kids you, requires a lot of patience, right? Oh, um, a lot. Compassion, <laughs> kindness, maybe even some humility. Mm -hmm. I hear math is a little bit different these days than it was when we went to school, right? So you're developing all of these skills while helping your children. And so I think sometimes we think that what we need to do is, you know, know the scriptures verbatim. And, and that's not what the Lord is asking us to do. The Lord is asking us to become Christ-like. And if we can become Christ-like by doing what we do every day with our children, then we don't need to look like the cover of the Enzyme magazine. We, we just need to learn patience, which is something that we're already doing. Uh, it's impossible to be selfish and to be a mom. Yeah. 
You're totally correct. You told me a story earlier about uh, having a migraine. Tell me that story again. Well, I think we often talk about um, comparisons, right? It, and it's common for us to say we shouldn't compare ourselves to other people, and that's great. That's really good advice. But I think the biggest mistake that women make is that they compare themselves to themselves on their best day. Mm -hmm. And so I think on a day that I have a migraine, um, the Lord doesn't expect the same from me as he does on a day that I'm feeling very, very healthy, right? Um, and so maybe on a day that I have a migraine, I make sure my kids are fed, I make sure their nappies or their diapers are changed, right? And I put the television on and I lay down with them and snuggle them. And they know that I love them, they're safe, they have all their needs met. Is it the most productive day for their learning? No, but does it matter? No, that was a successful day. You know, the, the alternative is me shouting at my children because they're making lots of noise and making my headache worse. And so I think that's success. Your kids are fed, you put the TV on. So does it mean we're progressing? We are progressing. The progression isn't linear, right? And I think sometimes we think Heavenly Father expects progression to be linear, right? That, that tomorrow has to be better than yesterday. Um, and that's not really true. I think, you know, progression is like this, right? Some days we're better, some days we're worse. And so we need to give ourselves some grace. Thank you. I love that. Give ourselves some grace. I need that. I needed to hear that. You brought a good point and it was like, we tend to compare ourselves to other people. And I can tell you that during this pandemic, uh, where we were home a lot, we were a lot on social media because that was our way to connecting. I saw a lot of people doing what it seemed, they seemed to be doing way better than I was doing. Their kids were like doing these great, you know, programs, online school was so smooth, they were even liking it. I wasn't. And then they were like exercising more because they had more time. I wasn't. I gained a few pounds actually during the pandemic. Me too. So how do we stop comparing ourselves? I know in a world like the one that we're living on today where just grab your phone and you have all these women, you know, posting and talking about their lives. How do we stop that? How do we come back and, and, and get that feeling that we're enough? We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I think we need to remember that what people are posting on social media is their very best day, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're not posting all of the other days on social media uh, as a rule. Um, but I think it's important for you to realize as well that, that you are doing a good job because you are you, right? Mm -hmm. and sometimes we, we compare ourselves to other people and the anxiety and the stress comes from trying to become that person, right? And yes. Heavenly Father never wanted me to become you, yes. right? That, that wasn't the goal. He wanted me to be the best version of me and you to be the best version of you. And so I think if we can remember that, um, it, it makes me think of uh, Pat Holland. She would also always say that Elder Holland was so bubbly and had all this energy and she, you know, initially in her marriage would try to be like him because everybody loved him. He was so great. Um, and she said, it just created a lot of anxiety and stress for me. and. It wasn't fun, it was exhausting. Um, but when I realized that I was a quiet, calm person, mm -hmm. um, I started to develop skills that only a calm, quiet person could develop, like sitting with my kids quietly and teaching them something or playing the piano or different things like that. And she said, that was very freeing to me to realize I can be my best self and it doesn't have to be anything like my husband's best self. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things about Relief Society is that it brings people that are very different into that, that society and we, we get rich from each other because we are all so different. And, and when we try to be the same or have some kind of an ideal, it hurts us, it takes that richness away. Yeah. I like that story about Sister Holland. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it, it's great. And I think I, w I was talking the other day to somebody about how kids often say, I have the best mom in the world. I have the, the best mom. And is that really true? I mean, we can't all be the best mom, right? But um, for me, I think I'm the best mom for yeah. Isabel and Sebastián, and you're the best mom for Diego and Lola, exactly. right? And so Heavenly Father figured out a way to pair us with people who had needs that matched the skills and attributes that we have, whether it's a parent or a sibling or a spouse or a friend. You know, we've been associating or paired with people who need what we have to offer. And if we don't offer that, then we end up with too many of the same skill and not enough of something else, right? Yeah, I love that, and I love that perspective. Um, it brings us to another one of the questions that we've received, and let's talk a little bit now about how, as women, we wear many, many hats, and the, the three of us right here in this room, we wear many, many hats. And this sister is asking, how do we balance our different roles 
so we can feel fulfilled or at peace with each of our roles instead of just feeling like we can do any of them well enough. How I always picture my life is like I, I have like so many balls rolling on the air. My professional, I'm a mom, my calling, I'm a wife. Sometimes one falls, one if only. Sometimes I only have one <laughs> and all the others are all spread out on the floor. But you know, how do we balance that? As women, Sister Ivan, with your super demanding calling, your family, the same with you, Gemma, how, how do we find that balance? That's a question that a lot of people ask me and I'm like, when you do find it, tell me and share. How, how do we reach for that? Okay, um, I, I might not answer this the way you want, but I, first of all, I think balance is a bit of an illusion. I don't think that we can accomplish it ever. We'll be chasing it for eternity. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to put some balls down yes. um, gently and, and pick up one. Uh, we, we talk about multitasking a lot, but when you look at recent research, our brain actually isn't capable of multitasking. And so when we think we're doing it, what we're really doing is switching from one task to another. And when we do that, we're ignoring one task and mm -hmm. focusing on another task, mm -hmm. right? Um, my husband tries to clean his ears and brush his teeth at the same time. Oh, well, that's talent, and, right? <laughs> and no, it takes him twice as long as it would if he did one task and then the other task, uh -huh. right? And so um, sometimes we think that, that we're moving faster. The same thing happens with me. I st I'm writing a document and I get an email and I have to look at the email and I because yeah. I am distracted. But if I turn off my email, suddenly the document gets done much faster and I can do the emails in the same time that I would have. And so w we need to stop trying to juggle, right? Um, and we're gonna enjoy things more when we're present, right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was thinking about my daughter the other day. She was kind of talking, talking, talking because she talks all the time. And I was trying to, to do something for work. I was trying to write an email and her voice was background noise and it became annoying and stressful Right? I was like, uh, uh, let me finish this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was focused on one thing, but it, but it wasn't her, right? Um, when I'm focused 100% on her voice, her voice is beautiful and I have a wonderful time with her mm -hmm. and everything else becomes background noise. And I think we need to remember that while it would be wonderful to be able to focus on my daughter 100% of the time, that's not realistic, right? And in fact, it's, it's not good for her mm -hmm. to think that she can be the center of attention all the time. And so there are gonna be times where she's at the forefront and times where she's not. And I think both of those things are, are okay, that there's, there's nothing wrong with them. They're fine. And I would like to know for you, Sister Ivan, how do you combine and, and, and make it all happen, you know, in your, your calling, your professional life, your family, your spiritual growing? I think the 21st century is a time when we've been asked to do s too many things. There are too many choices and we, we don't know what to do. And you just helped me by saying something that we, sometimes you have to set down balls mm -hmm. and we, we need to replenish ourselves besides multiplying out and giving things. And I sometimes think we think to be good women, we can't take time to replenish ourselves. That's a luxury. And I love the parts of the gospel that are replenishing, the sacrament every week, the temple, prayer, just a little bit of time to just be alone with our thoughts with God. He asks us, he commands us to do those giving, replenishing things every day as a gift to us. And, and so in my life, when I'm trying to do too many things, I'm trying to focus on the replenishing things that he gives me so that I can put my energy into the balls that I've got to hold in my yeah. hand and sometimes set some other balls down. I can't do those right now because I've, I've got my hands full. Yeah, I think the key is learning to prioritize, right? That's exactly I, I right. learned this from a coworker. I asked her to give a presentation to my team, and she said, okay, well, it's in Spanish, and that's, you know, can you look over my presentation? I said, great. She said, I'll have it to you by five. And she, then she texted me at five, my daughter had a meltdown. Can I send it to you when she goes to bed? I said, great. The priority at that moment was her daughter, but at eight o'clock the next morning, the priority was the presentation because she was giving it, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's not that our child's always the priority or our job's always the priority, it's that there are different aspects of each one that, that has to be the priority in that exact moment and the others just have to wait. That's, that's so true. I'm taking notes. I'm going to take all this. <laughs> something in case it helps you sisters, but something that I've learned also in my Outlook calendar, I now schedule me an hour every day and I schedule it and I mark it as busy. Mm -hmm. So when people are trying to schedule meetings or I try to schedule kids activities, I know that that's an hour 
that I need, and that's when I do my scripture study sometimes. Sometimes I focus on presentations for mm -hmm. work things. Sometimes that's when I uh, do meal prep or something, but scheduling. Like I'm asking myself permission to have that hour with no other, you know, things interfering so I can focus. So I think we're on the same page. That's I excellent. can do so much better, but Gemma, <laughs> this is so, so important what you're sharing. So let's talk now a little bit more about, you know, depression and anxiety. A lot of the, the questions that we've reviewed, um, they're painful. They're painful to read. There's a lot of sisters hurting because they're dealing with that. And if we think it's, it's hard enough to do so many things, when you're dealing with depression, it's, it doubles, right? Like how hard it is to, to function and to do things. What is your best advice? What recommendations do you have with, uh, for sisters? And I know there are two different things, depression and anxiety, but mental healthness in general. What are And Gemma, tell us when to get help. How do you know when you've hit a line when you, when you might need some additional help? Okay, yeah, those are two good questions. I think D depression, um, really it's a focus on the past and the things that, that we could have done differently, maybe uh, did well, didn't do well. Uh, anxiety is a focus on the future, right? What, what I might do or might not do. And so anxiety kind of tends to paralyze us, right? Um, and when we don't do anything, that kind of cap catapults us into depression, right? Mm -hmm. And so the simplest thing to do is to do something. Right? And it doesn't really matter what you do. It might be, I'm going to go for a walk, or I'm going to get in the shower. Some days, maybe that's all you can do. Right? But, but when we sit and we think about those things, we, we kind of ruminate, and, and it gets worse. And when we really start to, to get our body moving, it, it starts to change our thoughts. And so that, that's probably the first thing. And for some people, it might be drawing, or writing, or singing. You know, it could be anything that kind of gets them out of that rut. It might be calling a friend if you're a social person, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that's probably the, the first thing that I would do. Um, when, I'm, when you're talking more about anxiety, uh, and this, this fits for depression as well, uh, one of the, the interventions that we use in counseling, so, so the theory is, is cognitive school of thought, right? Um, and what we're looking at is, okay, your thoughts impact your emotions, and so we need to be able to identify your thoughts, and then we need to be able to change them, or correct them, mm -hmm. so that the irrational ones become rational, right? And if you put this in a gospel perspective, um, you're not just making the thoughts rational, but you're giving yourself a real God response. What would Heavenly Father answer you if you said this? You know, if you said, I'm unlovable, or I need to be good at everything in order to, mm -hmm. to, to be loved, or mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not needed. You know, I, I, I think I was talking to, to Sharon earlier about, um, I had a, a grandmother that came in and said, you know, I just don't have any purpose. My children used to need me, and they don't. And I don't really know how I'm helpful, right? And so she, so that was the thought, I'm not needed. And so we challenge, you know, what would Heavenly Father say about this? Um, and some of the responses were maybe, you've done such a great job at making your kids self-reliant <laughs> that they need you less than they used to, right? Mm -hmm. um, or they need you, but they need you in other ways. So now you don't have to tie their shoes or cook their food, but, but they call you for emotional support. And so those are some ways that maybe can be needed. And I think it's hard to correct our thoughts sometimes when we're talking mm -hmm. about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even um, the stretch to say, what would Heavenly Father say is difficult. But I find when I'm working with clients that if we can think, if you had a child who said this to you, what would you respond? They can correct the thought like that mm -hmm. um, because they know it's not a rational thought. So the, the difficulty is applying the change to ourselves, right? And I think that's where we, we use Heavenly Father. Right? We lean on Him and say, I know this is true. Help me believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and so w when it comes to getting help, um, I think we can do a lot of these things. You know, we can self-care, we can get enough sleep, we can drink enough water, we can eat regular meals, we can exercise, we can have uh, a social connection every day, we can have a spiritual connection every day. If we're doing all of those things and we're still struggling and it's been a couple of weeks, um, then maybe those symptoms are more than than what we can handle with some of these tools. And that's and when you reach okay. out to your bishop. It's okay to mm -hmm. ask for help. Talk to us a little bit about what are the tools available for, so that, for yeah. everyone. There, let me just pull up my mm -hmm. 
my gospel library. So if you jump into the gospel library, there's a section called Life Help. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are enough tools that you could spend a whole year reading them, I think. But um, if you go to the self-reliance section, um, there's a new emotional resilience manual that came out in the last year. And it's got different sections. There is a section on anxiety and depression. Um, there's an, a, a section on overcoming anger, um, mm -hmm. overcoming stress. And so you can go in and it, uh, it's got several tools. One of them is mindfulness, um, just kind of getting a hold of your thoughts. Another one you can um, do an evaluation tool where it will tell you, you know, how stressed you are and it will oh. color code it. <laughs> um, and so you can learn all of these tools right on the app and mm -hmm. they're fantastic. And there's some great videos if you go into um, the section on mental health as well, help for me. There are some fantastic videos from people who talk about their struggles and they're, they're really insightful. Uh, I mean, one example is comparing worthiness and perfectionism, right? Those mm -hmm. are some things that sometimes we struggle with and you can be perfectly worthy, uh, but not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so those are some things that I think might be helpful. And what about for people who love somebody who's struggling? Yeah, that, we've got a section on that as well. So uh, help for uh, a struggling spouse, with depression, help for a caretaker, maybe. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the Family Services has created all these modules to help uh, those people so that they can have a resource in their home on their smartphone. Um, and so hopefully uh, this will be a, a good resource for, for all the sisters out there. And if people thought that they needed to talk to somebody, somebody professional to help them, how would they find someone to help? So th the first step is to talk to your bishop. Um, your bishop is aware of either family services, if you have a family services in your country, or um, the Welfare Self-Reliance Manager will have a list of community resources, um, uh, mental health professionals, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists that are in the community that family services already vetted and, and kind of interviewed and made sure they've got the right credentials. And so they will connect you with somebody. And Gemma, how do we break that stigma sometimes that it comes with like, well, I don't need help. I can get over this. I'm, I'm just feeling a little blue or, you know, it's normal, this anxiety. When, how do we, do you know, like reach out for help? I think that what, one of the biggest principles in the gospel is self-reliance, right? And so that sometimes shoots us in the foot because we feel like I should be self-reliant. I shouldn't get help, right? But the principle of self-reliance is completely the opposite. It's I'm going to find all the resources and tools available. So if I have diabetes, I'm going to go to a specialist and I may get on insulin or medication, right? Um, that is me being self-reliant. If I'm not mm -hmm. self-reliant, I just sit here and think, oh, and I get sicker, right? Yeah. Um, it's the same with depression and anxiety. Being self-reliant is saying, I've identified that I have a problem and I know where to go for help and I'm going to get that help. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that's really how we need to look at things. And, we don't talk about it enough, right? Uh, no, there's it's okay to ask for help, right? That's the message. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, I love it. And I also think Heavenly Father is a huge resource. He knows us. He loves us. He understands exactly where we are. He'll point us to those resources. He'll open doors for us. And we don't ever have to walk that by ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, Gemma. Let's read this other question that we got also from one of the sisters that submitted a question for the Sister to Sister event. She's asking, um, how do I face the guilt and shame I feel when I hear local and general church leaders encouraging us to take this time as home, at home, talking about the pandemic, uh, to focus more on family history work, ministering, studying the scriptures, reading conference talks. I know it sounds ideal, right? I'm home, I have all the time, you know, like I don't have to commute, but then we know that's not the reality, right? And it comes with a lot of guilt. I, I should use better, you know, my time. How do we deal with that, those feelings of guilt of not being better at doing those things? I think um, where I would start is that the Lord loves effort, as President Nelson says, right? That That's something that we need to remember. And I think our best today is not going to be the same as our best yesterday or the best our best tomorrow, but, but that is the standard for each day uh, based on our capabilities for that day. Um, I had a family friend um, was talking to my daughter the other day and, and she's you know really smart and she speaks Spanish really fast and so she said, how come you're so clever? <laughs> and my daughter, I mean, she only speaks Spanish, but she said, porque me esfuerzo, <laughs> um, because I try hard, you know? Uh -huh. um, and that is the number one message that I want my daughter to learn, 
and that is that we make mistakes, lots of them. We're human, and we're actually supposed to make mistakes. That's how we learn. You, you think about all of these experts, right? Einstein, how did he get to the theory of relativity? Mm -hmm. He messed mm -hmm. up a lot first, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the mistakes that we make that lead us uh, to learn things and, and to be better. And so Heavenly Father knew, right? He, he, he knew we were going to make these mistakes, and that's why he sent the Savior. And so we need to give ourselves some grace. We need to, to cut ourselves some slack. I think th the way that we look sometimes at, um, at our lives is a list of here are all the things that I've done wrong. Here are my mistakes from the past week or from the past year. And we think that because we look at ourselves that way, that our children, that our, our spouse, our Heavenly Father, our siblings, maybe our employer, look at us that way. And the truth is, they don't. Mm -hmm. they, they forget all of those things. And mm -hmm. the way that they look at us is a bit more like um, when it flashes up on my phone, here's a memory from Facebook or from Google Photos oh. from last year. And it's a beautiful memory, right? And I look like the best mom ever in that picture, yeah. <laughs> right? And so that's what my kids remember. They don't mm -hmm. remember all the other mess ups I did in between, mm -hmm. right? The day I raised my voice or I punished them when I shouldn't have or I was impatient. I hope not. They, I don't, hope they don't remember. They don't. They don't, right? Good. And so I think that's how we, we need to see ourselves because that's how Heavenly Father sees us. Um, he focuses on here, here are, this is who they truly are. Mm -hmm. These were some slip ups along the way as they learned, right? Yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's key to think about, that there's a, a concept that's been going around the missionary department a lot, um, which is a focus on growth mindset, right? Sometimes we have a fixed mindset. These are the things I can do, and these are the things I can't do, right? And the truth is that we can do anything that is required of us, right? Any mm -hmm. skill or attribute that we need to have in order to reach salvation, all of us have the divine potential to do it. And so we, we might not be able to do it today, but that doesn't mean we can't do it tomorrow. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up uh, President Nelson, it. the Lord loves effort. That's my theme for this year. That's what I chose <laughs> in January. Mm -hmm. And it helps me just realize he cares, he, he rewards the effort, not the outcome necessarily, but, but what we learned as we went along. So I'm so happy you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gemma, thank you so much. Again, you've been a delight to talk to, and, and I know you know that the answers and the insight that you've shared is going gonna, is gonna to help a lot of sisters. I know it's helped me. It's helped me too. Sister Rebecca. So thank you so much. Keep doing the good work and keep being the best mom for your kids. I love that, that she says, you know, you are the best mom for your kids. I am the best mom for mine too. So thank you again for, for being willing to, to talk to us today. Thank you very much, Eden, and thank you, Sharon. It's been a pleasure to be here. We're so glad that we have you, and this has been really helpful today. Thank you.